You cannot build a great team without great players. That is a fact. As the saying goes, you can lose with good players, but you cannot win without them. So how are you going to get good players? For that matter, how are you going to get to become a better player yourself? When it comes to having good people on a team, you really have only two choices. Train them or trade them. You either grow the players you already have into champions, or you go out and recruit championship caliber people and bring them onto the team. These lessons can help you do either. Developing a better team always begins with you. To improve the team, improve the individuals on the team. You can become a better team member by embracing the qualities in this program. My recommendation is that you work your way through these lessons slowly. Listen to a chapter at a time. Digest it. If you want to assess yourself related to a particular quality, go to the website www.qualitiesofateamplayer.com. By embracing the process, you can become the kind of person every team wants. Improving yourself will add value to your team. But if you have a leadership role on your team, it's especially vital. Why? Because you can effectively teach only what you consistently model. It takes one to know one, show one, and grow one. Once you model the behavior you expect from your teammates, then begin using the 17 essential qualities of a team player as a training resource. It can be used to help your players become better team contributors regardless of their level of talent. And any time you desire to recruit new players from outside of the team, use these qualities as a guide for finding the kind of players who will put the team first. You can be sure that anyone who displays all 17 qualities will be a team player. God-given ability may be out of our control, but the ability to work as a team isn't. All people can learn to choose to become better teammates. All they need to do is embody the qualities of a team player. Do that yourself and then help your teammates do the same, and the whole team will excel. Quality number one, adaptable. If you won't change for the team, the team may change you. Quincy Jones has become a legend in the entertainment industry. He has worked with the best in the business, starting in the bebop era, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Lionel Hampton, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Ray Charles, Miles Davis, and the list goes on. He produced the best-selling music single of all time, We Are the World. He produced the best-selling album of all time, Michael Jackson's Thriller. He's been nominated for more Grammy Awards than any other person, and as of today, he has won a total of 27. Quincy Jones was born in 1933 in Chicago and spent his first decade in one of the city's roughest neighborhoods. Then his family moved to Bremerton, Washington. Soon afterward, Jones discovered his love for music. At age 11, he decided that he wanted to play an instrument, so he started trying things out. Even back then, he showed signs of a quality that would mark him as a professional, his adaptability. He began staying after school and trying out a variety of instruments to see which one he wanted to play. He tried percussion, the clarinet, violin, baritone, French horn, sousaphone, and trombone. Finally, he landed on the trumpet, and he excelled. By age 14, he had his first paying job as a musician. Jones always displayed a strong hunger to learn, which he calls an obsessive curiosity and an amazing adaptability. Through the years, he has easily transitioned from musician to arranger to band leader. In the 1950s, he worked with many of the greatest jazz performers. In 1957, when he thought he could use more education, he moved to Paris and studied under Nadia Boulanger, who had tutored Aaron Copland and Leonard Bernstein. At that time, Jones took a position with Mercury Records to make ends meet. That's where he learned the business side of the music industry. He was so good at it, that in 1964, the company made him a vice president. It was also in the 60s that Jones decided to tackle a new challenge, scoring movies. He's gone on to write music for more than 30 movies and numerous television programs. Flexibility and creativity have served Jones well. It's not only enabled him to work with all kinds of musicians, from Latin to pop and jazz to rap, 
It also has made it possible for him to bring the best out of any person he works with. He adapts to the person and the situation to create a win for everyone. Everyone has a different way of relating to people, observes Jones. I take everybody one-on-one, and I'm happy I do because I've had some great relationships that transcend show business. Jones himself has transcended professionally. He has used his adaptability to branch out into other industries. He broke into filmmaking when he produced The Color Purple. Then he took on television, producing several hit shows, including The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Jones and several partners launched Quest Broadcasting, and he is also the founder and chairman of Vibe Magazine. To Jones, being able to adjust or stretch himself is not a big thing. It's just who he is. Currently, he's working on writing a Broadway show based on the life of Sammy Davis Jr., Jones has never been afraid of a new idea, a new team, a new industry. Challenges have been no problem to him because he is so incredibly adaptable. Teamwork and personal rigidity just don't mix. If you want to work well with others and be a good team player, you have to be willing to adapt yourself to your team. As Harvard Business School professor Rosabeth Moss Cantor observed, the individuals who will succeed and flourish will also be masters of change. Adept at reorienting their own and others' activities in untried directions to bring about higher levels of achievement. Team players who exhibit adaptability have certain characteristics. Adaptable people are, number one, teachable. Diana Nyad said, I am willing to put myself through anything. Temporary pain or discomfort means nothing to me as long as I can see that the experience will take me to a new level. I am interested in the unknown, and the only path to the unknown is through breaking barriers. Adaptable people always place a high priority on breaking new ground. They are highly teachable. Look at Quincy Jones, and you see someone who is always learning. His belief is that if a person works hard and becomes highly skilled in one area, he can transfer that ability to new endeavors. That approach can work for anyone who's teachable. On the other hand, Unteachable people have a difficult time with change, and as a result, they never adapt well. Number two, emotionally secure. Another characteristic of adaptable people is security. People who are not emotionally secure see almost everything as a challenge or a threat. The addition of another talented person to the team, an alteration in their position or title, or a change in the way things are done are all met with rigidity or suspicion. But secure people aren't made nervous by change itself. They evaluate a new situation or a change in their responsibilities based on its merit. Number three, creative. Creativity is another quality you find in adaptable people. When difficult times come, they find a way. Quincy Jones remarked, There's an expression that says a person's age can be determined by the degree of pain he experiences when he comes in contact with a new idea. Somebody might say, let's try it this new way. You can actually see the pain. These people will grab their heads. It physically hurts to think of doing something different. The ones who don't react with fear are the really creative people. Let's try it, they'll say. Let's go there, even if we blow it. Creativity fosters adaptability. Number four, service-minded. People who are focused on themselves are less likely to make changes for the team than people focused on serving others. Educator and college president Horace Mann observed, Doing nothing for others is the undoing of oneself. If your goal is to serve the team, adapting to accomplish that goal isn't difficult. One way to become more adaptable is by thinking outside of the lines. Let's face it, many people aren't adaptable because they get into negative ruts. If you tend to be rut-prone, then write down this phrase and keep it where you can see it every day. Not why it can't be done, but how it can be done. Look for unconventional solutions every time you meet a challenge. You'll be surprised by how creative you can become if you continually strive to be. One of the greatest generals in military history was Napoleon Bonaparte. Made a full general at age 26, He utilized shrewd strategy, bold cunning, and lightning speed to his advantage to win many victories. The Duke of Wellington, one of the general's greatest enemies, said, 
I consider Napoleon's presence in the field to equal 40,000 men in the balance. I will tell you the mistake you always are making, Napoleon told an opponent he had once defeated. You draw up your plans the day before battle, when you do not know your adversary's movements. Napoleon recognized in his losing opponent a weakness that he did not have himself, lack of adaptability. If you are willing to change and adapt for the sake of your team, you always have a chance to win. Quality number two, collaborative. Working together precedes winning together. They called it the great escape. It wasn't great because it had never been done before. Prisoners of war had previously escaped from enemy camps. It wasn't called great because of the outcome. The results were terrible for most of the escapees. It was great because the scale of it made the task seem impossible. Stalig Luft III, a Nazi prisoner of war camp 100 miles southeast of Berlin, was a huge compound that once held as many as 10,000 Allied POWs. Within that camp in 1946 was a core group of prisoners who were determined to escape. In fact, their goal was to facilitate the escape of no fewer than 250 men in one night, something that would require the utmost cooperation among the prisoners. An escape so daunting had never been tried before. Getting men out of a German prison camp was a very complex task. Of course, there was the challenge of digging and hiding the tunnels, which would provide the means of escape. Together, a group of prisoners engineered the tunnels, dug them, shored them up with wooden slats taken from prisoners' beds, and disposed of the dirt in amazingly creative ways. They pumped air into the tunnels with homemade bellows. They created tracks and trolleys used by men to move through the tunnels. They even wired the narrow passages with electric lights. The list of supplies needed for the job is unbelievable. 4,000 bed slats, 1,699 blankets, 52 long tables, 1,219 knives, 30 shovels, 600 feet of rope, 1,000 feet of electric wire, and more. It took an army of prisoners just to find and steal all the materials for the tunnels. However difficult building the tunnels was, creating the means of escape was only part of the whole project. Every man who would attempt escape needed a host of supplies and equipment. Civilian clothes, German papers and identity cards, maps, homemade compasses, emergency rations, and other items. Several prisoners continually scrounged for anything that might aid the team. Others worked systematically and relentlessly at bribing and then blackmailing the guards. Each person had a job. There were tailors, blacksmiths, pickpockets, and forgers who worked secretly month after month. The prisoners even developed teams of men who specialized in distraction and camouflage, keeping the German soldiers off guard. On the night of March 24, 1946, after more than a year of work, 220 men prepared to creep through the tunnel and into the woods outside of the prison camp. The plan was to send out one man per minute until they had all made their escape. German-speaking prisoners would board trains and pose as foreign workers. The rest would lay low during the day and travel at night, hoping to avoid German patrols. However, there was a problem. When the first prisoner popped up out of the tunnel, he discovered that its exit was short of the woods. Rather than getting out a man per minute, they were barely able to get out a dozen per hour. In all, 86 men escaped before the tunnel was discovered. It created chaos for the Nazis, who ordered a national alert to deal with it. Sadly, 83 of the prisoners were captured, and 41 of them were executed by order of Adolf Hitler. Only three made it to freedom. John Sturgis, the man who directed the 1963 movie The Great Escape, based on the real event, said of the prisoners' effort, It demanded the concentrated devotion and vigilance of more than 600 men. Every single one of them, every minute, every hour, every day, and every night for more than a year. Never has the human capacity been stretched to such incredible lengths or shown with as much determination and courage. Great challenges require great teamwork. And the quality most needed among teammates amidst the pressure of a difficult 
challenge is collaboration. Notice that I didn't say cooperation, because collaboration is more than that. Cooperation is working together agreeably. Collaboration is working together aggressively. Collaborative teammates do more than just work with each other. Each person brings something to the table that adds value to the relationship and synergy to the team. The sum of truly collaborative teamwork is always greater than its parts. Becoming a collaborative team player requires a change in focus in four areas. Number one, perception. See teammates as collaborators, not competitors. Look at any team and you can see the potential for competition. Siblings fight for their parents' attention. Coworkers compete for raises and promotions. Ball players go head to head to see who will be the starter and who will sit on the bench. Because all people have hopes, goals, and dreams they want to achieve. But to collaborative team members, completing one another is more important than competing with one another. They perceive themselves as a unit working together. And they never allow competition between teammates to get to the point where it hurts the team. Number two, attitude. Be supportive, not suspicious of teammates. Some people are so preoccupied with looking out for their own interest that they are naturally suspicious of just about everyone, including their teammates. But adopting the mindset where you complete rather than compete with teammates is possible only if you suspend your suspicions and become a supportive team player. It's a matter of attitude. That means assuming that other people's motives are good unless proven otherwise. If you trust people, you will treat them better. And if you treat them better, both you and they will be more likely to create collaborative relationships. Number three, focus. Concentrate on the team not yourself. As a person on a team, you will usually ask one of two questions when anything happens. What's in it for me? Or, what does this do for the team? Where you focus your attention says a lot about whether you compete with others or complete them. Author Cavett Roberts points out, true progress in any field is a relay race and not a single event. If you focus on the team and not just yourself, you will be able to pass the baton when necessary instead of trying to complete the race by yourself. Number four, results. Create great victories through multiplication. When you work together with your teammates, you can do great things. If you work alone, you leave a lot of victories on the table. Collaboration has a multiplying effect on everything you do because it releases and harnesses not only your skills, but those of everyone on the team. To become a collaborative team, think win, win, win. As King Solomon of ancient Israel observed, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Usually when you collaborate with others, you win, they win, and the team wins. Find someone on the team with a similar role who you have previously seen as a competitor. Figure out ways you can share information and work together to benefit both of you and the team. A group of boys was hiking in the woods one day when they came across part of an old abandoned railroad track stretching off through the trees. One of the boys jumped up onto the rails and tried walking on it. After a few steps, he lost his balance. Another boy soon tried the same thing and he also fell. The others laughed. I'll bet you can't do it either, he barked at the others. One by one, the boys tried it, but they all failed. Even the best athlete of the bunch couldn't go more than a dozen steps without stumbling. Then two of the boys began whispering to one another, and one of them challenged the others. I can walk on the rail all the way to the end, and so can he, as he pointed to his buddy. No, you can't, said one of the other boys who had tried and failed. Bet you candy bar we both can, he answered, and the other boys accepted. Then the two boys who had issued the challenge each hopped up onto a rail, reached out an arm, locked hands with each other, and carefully walked the whole distance. As individuals, they could not meet the challenge. But working together, they easily won. The power of collaboration is multiplication.
Quality number three, committed. There are no half-hearted champions. In 1939, a 20-year-old man from New York City named Jonas Salk completed his training at NYU Medical School. And though he chose to become a doctor, Salk's real passion was research. He was intrigued by contradictory scientific claims by two professors which prompted him to begin studying immunology, including influenza research. And during his second year of medical school, when he got a chance to spend a year doing research and teaching, he took it. At the end of that year, he was told that he could switch and get a Ph.D. in biochemistry, but his preference was to stay with medicine. He believed that it was all linked to his original ambition or desire, which was to be of some help to humankind in a larger sense than just on a one-to-one basis. In 1947, Salk became the head of the virus research lab at the University of Pittsburgh. It was there that he began investigating the polio virus. In those days, polio was a horribly crippling disease that claimed the lives of thousands of people every year with children being the most frequent victims. In the first half of the 20th century, viral research was still in its infancy. But in 1948, a team of scientists at Harvard University discovered how to produce large quantities of viruses in laboratories, and that made greater research possible. Salk capitalized on those scientists' findings and groundbreaking work by others and began developing a polio vaccine. In 1952, after more than four years of continuous work, Salk and his team at the University of Pittsburgh developed a vaccine. They did some safe preliminary testing with it on people who had previously contracted polio and survived. But the true test would be injecting the vaccine, which contained inactive polio cells, into people who never had polio. Salk had shown his dedication to helping people through the years of study, preparation, and research. However, it's one thing to believe in something you're doing and another to be totally committed to it. In the summer of 1952, Jonas Salk inoculated healthy volunteers with his vaccine. Included in that group were himself, his wife, and their three sons. He was committed. Salk's commitment paid off. The trials of the vaccine were successful, and in 1955, he and his former mentor, Dr. Thomas Francis, arranged to inoculate 4 million children. In 1955, there were 28,985 cases of polio reported in the United States. In 1956, that number was cut in half. In 1957, there were only 5,894. Today, thanks to the work of Jonas Salk and subsequent efforts by other scientists such as Albert Sabin, Cases of polio in the United States are virtually non-existent. Jonas Salk dedicated eight years of his life to defeating polio, but his real desire was helping people, which he further demonstrated by never patenting the vaccine he created. In that way, it could be used to help people around the globe. You could say that the team he was most committed to was humankind. Many people tend to associate commitment with their emotions, If they feel the right way, then they can follow through on their commitments. But true commitment doesn't work that way. It's not an emotion. It's a character quality that enables us to reach our goals. Human emotions go up and down all the time. But commitment has to be rock solid. If you want a solid team, whether it's a business, ball club, marriage, or volunteer organization, you must have team players who are solidly committed to the team. There are some things every team player needs to know about being committed. Number one, it usually is discovered in the midst of adversity. People don't really know whether they are committed to something until they face adversity. Struggle strengthen a person's resolve. Adversity fosters commitment and commitment fosters hard work. And the more you work at something, the less likely you are to give up on it. As NFL Hall of Fame coach Vince Lombardi said, The harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. Committed people don't surrender easily. Number two, it does not depend on gifts or abilities. 
Sometimes when we see talented people who are highly successful, we may be tempted to think that commitment is easier for them because of their talent. It seems as if it might be easier for great athletes to practiced or skilled artists to refine their craft or natural business people to work at their business. But that isn't true. Commitment and talent are unconnected unless you connect them. Haven't you known highly talented people who have squandered their potential because they wouldn't do anything? And don't you know people less talented than you who are more successful? That is often due, in part, to commitment. Author Basil Walsh said, We don't need more strength or more ability or greater opportunity. What we need to use is what we have. If we will commit ourselves to using what talent we have, then we will find that we have more talent and more to offer our team as the result of our commitment. Number three, it comes as a result of choice, not conditions. When it comes right down to it, commitment is always a matter of choice. In Choices, Frederick F. Flack writes, Most people look back over the years and identify a time and place at which their lives changed significantly. Whether by accident or design, these are the moments when, because of a readiness within us and a collaboration with events occurring around us, we are forced to seriously reappraise ourselves and the conditions under which we live, and to make certain choices that will affect the rest of our lives. Far too many people think that conditions determine choices. More often, choices determine conditions. When you choose commitment, you give yourself a chance for success. Number four, it lasts when it's based on values. It's one thing to make a commitment in a moment. It's another thing to stick with it. How does a person remain committed? The answer lies in what you base your commitments on. Anytime you make choices based on solid life values, then you are in a better position to sustain your level of commitment because you don't have to continually reevaluate its importance. It's like settling the issue before it is tested. A commitment to something you believe in is a commitment that is easier to keep. To improve your level of commitment, tie your commitments to your values. Because your values and your ability to fulfill your commitments are closely related, take some time to reflect on them. First, make a list of your personal and professional commitments. Then, try to articulate your core values. Once you have both lists, compare them you will probably find that you have commitments unrelated to your values. Reevaluate them. You will also find that you have values that you are not living out. Commit yourself to them. How do you define true commitment? Let me tell you how Hernan Cortez defined it. In 1519, under the sponsorship of Cuba's Governor Vasquez, Cortez sailed from Cuba to the Mexican mainland with the goal of gaining riches for Spain and fame for himself. Though only 34 years old, the young Spanish captain had prepared his whole life for such a chance. But the soldiers under his command were not as dedicated as he. After he landed, there was talk that the men might mutiny and return to Cuba with his ships. What was his solution? He burned the ships. How dedicated are you to your team? Are you totally committed, or do you have an out just in case things don't work out? If so, maybe you need to burn a ship or two. Remember, there is no such thing as a half-hearted champion. Quality number four, communicative. A team is many voices with a single heart. A few years ago, screenwriter Gregory Allen Howard moved from Los Angeles to Alexandria, Virginia. One day in a local barber shop after he had settled in, Howard heard men talking about a local high school football team and how great it was. They went on and on about the players and their accomplishments. Finally, Howard asked where the team would be playing their next game so that he could go watch them. That's when he found out that the team the men loved was from 1971. Howard couldn't believe it. 
After three decades, that particular team was just as important to the people of the town as a team that was still playing. Howard got to thinking. Then he started researching. The more he found out, the more it intrigued him. He decided to write a screenplay about the true events surrounding that team, and that script was made into a movie called Remember the Titans. If you've seen the movie, then you probably remember that it was set at a time when many communities in the United States were in the process of dismantling segregation. In 1971, the town of Alexandria took tangible steps toward racial equality when it combined the populations of three high schools, two white and one black, into a new integrated school called T.C. Williams High School. It was a difficult time, and people from both racial communities were tense over the forced interaction. The first groups to come together were the black and white high school football players who were on a team together for the first time. Adding to the tension was the fact that Herman Boone, a black coach, was selected to be the head coach of the Williams football team rather than Bill Yost, a local white coach who was very popular in the community. Boone did everything in his power to bring the players on that team together. He forced black and white players to ride on buses together up to training camp. He also made them room together, but he was having a hard time getting them to come together as a team. The players kept separating themselves by race. So Coach Boone told all of the young men that until they all learned about every other player on the team, they could expect to endure grueling practices three times a day. It didn't occur easily, nor did it happen overnight. But the players got to know each other, and the team started to come together. Years later, when asked in an interview what the keys were in getting the team to bond, Herman Boone said, winning did it. Winning solves everything. It's all about communication, talking to each other. We force the kids to spend time with each other to find out things about each other. Every player was required to spend time with teammates who were a different race. That action turned the Titans around, and the team did win. They won every game of the regular season, the playoffs, and the state championship. By the time they were done, the Titans of 1971 were ranked the second-best high school team in the nation. But more important than their wins on the field was their impact off of it. In response to the Titans, the President of the United States, who lived less than 10 miles away across the Potomac River, stated simply, the team saved the city of Alexandria. Boone agrees. He remarked, the town decided to follow the team rather than those who wanted to tear the team and the town down. I believe the team did play a great role in keeping the city calm, focused, positive toward these young men who had shown the city that you can get along if you just talk to each other. It was a powerful message that they passed on for generations, and it will be passed on for generations. At a time when the city was ready to burn itself to the ground, these kids stepped out and changed attitudes among themselves and their community. And that is why, to this day, the people of Alexandria still remember and talk about the Titans. To state it bluntly, you cannot have teamwork unless you have communicative players. Without communication, you don't have a team. You have a collection of individuals. If you look at a good team, you will find that its players have some common characteristics. Players who communicate, number one, do not isolate themselves from others. The key problem Herman Boone had to overcome on his newly formed team was isolation. The players of one race isolated themselves from the players of the other. Anytime a player becomes isolated, it is a problem for the team. If entire sections of the team become isolated, that problem grows. The more teammates know about each other and about the team's goals and methods, the more they'll understand. The more they understand, the more they'll care. A player with passion as well as information and connection is a powerful asset to the team. Number two, make it easy for teammates to communicate with them. Most communication problems can be solved with proximity. That's why Herman Boone used it to get his team to gel. 
putting players of different races on the same buses and forcing them to room with one another made communication more likely to happen. If you look at good leaders and impact players on a team, you will find that they not only stay connected with their teammates, they make sure their teammates are able to make contact with them easily. Number three, follow the 24-hour rule. When some people are faced with conflict or interpersonal difficulties, they avoid the person with whom they are having the problem. But time alone doesn't usually fix such situations. That's because without knowing both sides of the story, people tend to give the benefit of the doubt to themselves and to assign negative motives and actions to others. Without communication, the situation just festers. That's why team members need to follow the 24-hour rule. If you have any kind of difficulty or conflict with a teammate, don't let more than 24 hours go by without addressing it. In fact, the sooner you communicate, usually the better off you and your teammates will be. Number four, give attention to potentially difficult relationships. Relationships need attention to thrive. That is especially true of relationships between people who have potential for conflict. One of the most volatile relationships on the Titans team was that between white linebacker Gary Petir and black defensive end Julius Campbell. The two started out hating each other, and they butted heads constantly. But through the course of the season, they became close friends. When Petir was paralyzed in an auto accident, The first person he asked for from his hospital bed was Julius. Their relationship may have developed slowly, but it grew strong. What Aristotle said is true. Friendship is a slow, ripening fruit. Number five, follow up important communication in writing. The more difficult communication becomes, the more important it is to work to keep it clear and simple. That often means putting communication in writing. It's not accidental that most marriages have vows, football teams have playbooks, and partnerships have contracts. When communication with your teammates is important, you'll find it easier to keep everyone on the same page if you've written it down for everyone's benefit. To improve your communication, be candid. Open communication fosters trust. Hidden agendas, communicating to people via a third party and sugarcoating bad news all hurt team relationships. Think about a poor relationship you have with someone on your team. If you haven't been candid with that person, then determine to change your ways. Your goal should be to speak truthfully but kindly to your teammates. A story called The Lion and the Three Bulls, written by the Greek fable writer Aesop, gives insight into how important it is for teammates to be communicative. Three bulls lived together for a long time in a pasture. Though they ate and lived side by side, they never spoke with one another. One day a lion came along and saw the bulls. Though the lion was very hungry, he knew he could never attack three bulls at once because together they would overpower him and kill him. So the lion approached the bulls one at a time. Since one bull never knew what the others were doing, they didn't realize the lion was working to separate them. The lion, who was crafty, succeeded in dividing them, and with them successfully isolated, he attacked them individually. Thus he overcame all three of them and satisfied his hunger. Aesop concluded the story by stating, Union is strength, but there can be no union without good communication. Quality number five, competent. If you can't, your team won't. When I was the senior pastor at Skyline Church in California, I became friends with a wonderful man in my congregation named Bob Taylor, who eventually became the vice chairman of my church board. Bob has always liked to build and tinker, so it was natural that when he got to junior high and then high school, he took every industrial arts class he could. I had some great teachers, Bob recalls. I had one who would open up the shop even on holiday weekends so that I could keep working on my projects. One of Bob's other interests is music. When Bob was in high school, he decided he wanted a good 12-string guitar. He had started playing when he was in the third grade after a neighbor had given him an inexpensive guitar, which he subsequently sawed open to see how it was built. 
The only problem was that Bob didn't really have the money to go out and buy the instrument he wanted. No problem, he figured. I'll just make one myself. And he did, as an 11th grade woodshop project. In fact, while in high school, he made not one but three guitars and a banjo. Now, lots of people pick up interesting hobbies in high school. Some individuals continue to pursue those hobbies, and others drop them as they grow older. But Bob did something really special with his. You see, if you play guitar yourself, you've probably walked into a music store and seen a Taylor guitar. Yes, he's that Bob Taylor. He went from building guitars in his spare time as a teenager to co-founding his own company. Bob's business partner of 27 years, Kurt Listig, has the passion for marketing and building a business while Bob provides the passion and technical expertise for building guitars. Today, Taylor Guitars builds some of the finest acoustic guitars in the world, and their manufacturing plant does it at the pace of 200 instruments a day. What has enabled Bob to go from solitary guitar maker to employer of more than 450 people who occupy a 124,000 square foot complex? The answer is his incredible competence and tireless dedication to excellence. Bob says he's a tweak head. He's continually trying to refine the process. That desire is focused on more than just the guitars themselves. True, Bob Taylor has introduced numerous innovations to guitar building. But Bob's real focus is on the manufacturing process and on people who build the guitars. Bob explains it this way. Good guitars are really the byproduct of good tools and a good facility. And, of course, the people part is so important. Building the team is as important as producing the product. You have to let the people be a team. That means fostering an environment where people say what they really think. You can't be too dogmatic. That attitude has allowed the best ideas to rise to the top and get implemented. Bob has found that to keep getting better, you have to let people come onto the team and let the quality of the product suffer for a while. It's a constant struggle to achieve. It's easy to talk about letting the quality suffer in a short term when your competence is so high and your product is so good that even at its worst, it's better than most in your industry. But that willingness to risk and innovate keeps paying off with better guitars. Bob says that inspiration is easy. Implementation is the hard work. Implementation May not be easy, but Bob continues to succeed because of his great competence and dedication to following through. Bob's daughter, Minet, sums up his ability by saying that he has an amazing desire to always make things better. If there's a way to improve, he has an ability to envision it. He was just saying the other day that he is still working out ideas that he's had since he was 19 that he would probably die before he could ever use them all. When you bring that kind of ability to the team, how can you lose? Bob Taylor isn't a flashy guy. He's soft-spoken, and if you met him on the street, you probably wouldn't guess that he owns a company that grossed $30 million in 1999. But if you spent any time with him, you would almost instantly recognize his incredible competence. The word competent sometimes gets used to mean barely adequate. When I talk about the quality of competence that is desirable in teammates, I mean it in the sense of its root word, which means complete. Competent team members are well qualified and have everything they need to do the job and do it well. People who are highly competent have some things in common. Number one. They are committed to excellence. John Johnson in Christian Excellence writes, Success bases our worth on a comparison with others. Excellence gauges our value by measuring us against our own potential. Success grants its rewards to the few, but is the dream of the multitudes. Excellence is available to all living beings, but it is accepted by the few. The reason Bob Taylor says that you can let quality slip while accepting new people on the team is that his standards are already so high that a small slip doesn't hurt him much. 
He and his people are thoroughly committed to excellence. Number two, they never settle for average. The word mediocre literally means halfway up a stony mountain. To be mediocre is to do a job halfway, to leave yourself far short of the summit. Competent people never settle for average. They focus their energy and efforts on what they do well, giving all they've got. Number three, they pay attention to detail. Dale Carnegie said, Don't be afraid to give your best to what seemingly are small jobs. Every time you conquer one, it makes you that much stronger. If you do little jobs well, the big ones tend to take care of themselves. When Bob started out making guitars, he did all the little jobs himself. Now he functions more as a team leader and designer of processes and manufacturing equipment. But he and his people still pay attention to the details. That has earned them the place they have achieved in the industry. Taylor is the largest producer of acoustic guitars in the world. Number four, they perform with consistency. Highly competent people perform with great consistency. They give their best all the time, and that's important. If 99.9% were good enough, then 811,000 faulty rolls of 35-millimeter film would be loaded this year. 22,000 checks would be deducted from the wrong bank accounts in the next 60 minutes, and 12 babies would be given to the wrong parents today alone. I'm not a musician myself, but I'm told that if you try out a dozen identical instruments from most guitar manufacturers, you find some good ones, many average ones, and a few real stinkers. But a producer-songwriter friend says that if you pick up a Taylor guitar, there's never a bad one in the bunch. That's consistency. One way i found to improve competence is to sweat the small stuff. Most people don't take their work as far as they can. To do that, you need to develop an ability to get all the details right. That doesn't mean becoming a micromanager or control freak. What it means is doing the last 10% of whatever job you're doing. Try doing that on the next project or big task that is your responsibility. A sea captain and a crusty old chief engineer were talking one day, and they began to argue about whose expertise was most needed for the running of the ship. The debate got more and more heated, and finally the captain decided that they should trade jobs for a day. Chief engineer would be on the bridge, and the captain would go down to the engine room. Only a few hours into their shift, the captain emerged from below the deck sweating, his face and uniform covered with dirt and oil. Chief, he bellowed. You need to get down to the engine room. I can't get her to go. Of course you can't, barked the chief. She's aground. Quality number six, dependable. Teams go to go-to players. At the 1979 Academy Awards, John Wayne turned to Cary Grant and said, This is our new man. He's taking over for us. Wayne was talking about Christopher Reeve. Aided not only by his acting skills, but his good looks and imposing physique at six foot four inches tall, he became a star. In 1995, at age 42, Reeve had performed in 17 feature films, including the blockbuster Superman, a dozen movies for television, and about 150 plays. He was financially secure and had achieved critical acclaim. He was married to his best friend, Dana, and had three wonderful children. But then his life turned upside down. On May 27, 1995, during the cross-country portion of a riding competition, Christopher Reeve was thrown from his horse. He crashed headfirst onto the fence his horse had refused to jump and then crashed sprawling onto the ground. He had sustained a crippling injury in the spine at the first and second vertebrae. His breathing stopped. He was paralyzed from the neck down. If the paramedics hadn't arrived in minutes, he would not have lived. Reeve has no memory of the fall. A serious spinal cord injury is difficult for any person to survive emotionally as well as physically. And in the hours after he first woke up, Reeve began to understand the real importance of a team. Reeve says that when they told him what his condition was, he felt that he was no longer a human being. 
But then Dana, his wife, came into the room and knelt down to the level of the bed. They made eye contact. Reeve remembers saying, Maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe I should just check out. Dana was crying and said, But you're still you, and I love you. And that, Reeve says, saved his life. 